I think Dub does pretty good for someone that's about to leave this mortal coil. Yeah. I do know what Ken means, though, and I, and I, I do appreciate it. it in, in all seriousness, it, it is good to see the, some of the, the younger men who are capable of, of taking up the mantle, the John Wests and the John Roses, and then if you, you, know, you really want to stretch the definition of young, the Bruce Steltings and, and people like that. Hmm? <laughs> well, I told you I was stretching it. This is uh, oh, okay. <laughs> this is the second occasion I've I've had to introduce Brother David, I, and again very pleased to do so. Uh, hold David in high regard, and I think everybody in this auditorium does too. Anybody that stands for the truth in the brotherhood. I didn't mention this uh, or make any, any kind of a deal about it because I, I know that he doesn't. In his humility, he doesn't point out that he does have that Ph.D. now. And uh, I'm pleased that he did it to, in seriousness that shows some of us old Mossback conservatives can attain the higher degrees too. And uh, those that look at us uh, condescendingly will at least see a few advanced degrees. Even Kenneth has an advanced degree. He's got a master in accounting, I believe. David, I think he, he even looked, looked into doing his PhD also. And uh, as you know, it can be kind of expensive. So naturally, Ken was looking for a deal. Well, I told him, I said, Kenneth, look, uh, I don't think anybody's going to be real impressed with a degree from uh, Our Lady of the Detention Pond University. So, <laughs> again, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce David. He's, uh, he's worked in a, a lot of places, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and we're, again, we're so very pleased to have him here at Spring so we can avail ourselves of his uh, capabilities and his knowledge and uh, his handling of the scriptures and we get it on a weekly basis and we're very grateful. David, come speak to us. Thank you, Brother Buddy. One of the things that one must ever keep before his or her mind is that uh, when you stand up to do whatever you're doing, uh, you're not the only one that can do it. And there'll be the time when I'll stand in this pulpit the last time. Last time I'll ever have anything to do with the lectureship, the book, or anything else. When that time will be, maybe sooner, maybe later. But I have often wondered what there is about people that seek the chief seats and they must be seen and declare themselves to be some great one. It may come as a very much of a surprise to you, but if I just did without any knowledge of God, the Lord's church, the gospel, the Bible, the importance of it, and people in this audience know what I mean regarding the power of God to save and the gospel and the charge of the church, every one of us, to preach it and defend it. If I just did what I wanted, I'd be sitting in overalls back up in Camden, Arkansas, ignoring all of this fuss and doing just what I wanted to do. And I found out in my work with brethren that uh, that seems to be one of the things that challenges them. The business to always be seen of somebody. Uh, I remember, this may come as a terrible shock to some of you, but when I was about 16, I wasn't expected to be called on to lead prayer in vacation Bible school before we passed the classes. I was sitting, I remember, right on the second pew at the Colonel Church of Christ, and I guess they thought I was good enough to lead prayer when they called upon me not knowing I was going to. I couldn't do it. I punched the fellow next to me, and he led it. Now, somebody like that can accomplish a little bit that I have because of necessity, the importance of it, service to God, and to make themselves step into areas to where it just was not that natural for me to step. You may think it was, but it wasn't. Uh, because of obligation, a sense of responsibility. I'm only wishing I could even do better than uh, I don't know what to think, but I just know someday my time here is over. And that's the way it is. 
and we must face that and realize that. Uh, I would say this, and then I'll get right on into the lesson. I would say this very quickly. When I came here and they asked me to do the lectureship, do y'all remember when we got here in February and about March, he said, can you get us the lectureship together this summer? I said, well, I can do it. There won't be any book, but we can get them in together. And we did. And all due respect for everybody, Al Brown was here then, and we haven't said anything about him, but we're still standing on his shoulders. I know I am, and what he did, and all the elders will say that. But in all due respect to everybody, they didn't know what a lectureship was all about from a monkey in a coconut tree, except what a lectureship was. But they don't need me now when it comes to this lectureship. I wonder why. They don't need me, really, when it comes to this pulpit. They don't need me. I have, in effect, worked myself out of a job. Now, that's what I hope I can say if my mind's about me. When it's come time to die. Time to go home. It's time to let, for lack of a better way to put it, Elijah's mantle to fall upon Elisha. That's the way we want to look at it and let the whole course of things work as God intended. But we have some things to cover here today, and I'm sorry Daniel can't be with us. Daniel is one of the best I've ever seen. These brethren know how I feel about Daniel, especially as I've commented in his ability, his knowledge, his uh, recall when it comes to being in a debate. I'll say it again. If I'm debating, I, I want Daniel sitting next beside me. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge, and it's evident in and the preparation he did in the book. And I urge you to get the book, to read his chapter and all the rest that's in there. Uh, I know that you've got material in Daniel's stuff in particular, but the whole book that you can use on down the line in preaching sermons uh, on these particular topics, and especially what is the emerging church. But I will approach this a little different from Daniel. I'll use some of his material, but I'm going to be referring to this book I'll mention in just a minute. What is the emerging church? Sometimes it's referred to as the emergent church. He refers to it in its um, abbreviation, uh, ECM. Here is the way I would sum up everything about the so-called emergent church or the emerging church. And it's with scripture. In Judges 17 and verse number 6, in those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Without going into the details of what they believe and where they get there and all of their highfalutin words, their PhD words. By the way, my degrees have nothing to do with theology or religion. They have to do with secular matters, education, social science, and business. And um, the business thing was one of the most enjoyable studies I've ever had. There's been some things in the area of education I've tried to figure out who in the world came up with this. And that's just, well, I hate to say it, you teachers, but some of the stuff in education, and I've studied from the masters all the way, all coursework or a doctorate, I don't know where they came up with some of that stuff. I think they were postmodernists in hiding. And I know there's plenty of postmodernists in education. But coming back now to this, uh, without going into all the details and all their highfalutin terms, uh, that really sums it up. Just do what you want to do. Do you think that's right? That's right. If you want to be inconsistent, well, that's right. If you want to be really emphatic that you can't be emphatic, boy, that's really right. That's what you've got in the whole mess. That just covers it. It is lunacy gone to seed, if not worse, if that's possible. They do this, first of all, because the very first point that ought to be brought out, and this is where I'm going to spend a great deal of time, is on their surrender to what is called postmodernism. Now, you've heard that term for some time now. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. Modernism was the idea that you reason from a premise to a conclusion. 
in an appropriate way in logic. Modernism was empirical, though. It only allowed you to say what's knowable is what you can examine with the five senses in the test tube, in the laboratory. But they still believed that you could come to an absolute objective conclusion about the truth. Now, they would not accept miracles. They didn't accept the existence of God. They didn't accept uh, the inspiration of the scriptures. Uh, Jonah and the great fish was a laughing thing to them because they, they looked at everything. You can only know it as it's perceived through the five senses. And what is that? It's whatever is material, whatever is of this world. So things like miracles didn't bother them, but they still said you can know. And that's the reason that Brother Warren debated flu back in those days and, no, and, and flu was saying, I know there is no God because he thought that you could prove it. So he said he found out he couldn't. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, that's where they were. Well, the postmodernist comes along and the postmodernist doesn't believe in God anymore than they do, but the postmodernist doesn't believe in the reason that they use either. Doesn't believe that there is an absolute objective truth, spiritual or material or empirical or anything else. It's just not there. That's what you've got in these people in the emerging church. So the first major tenet or underlying principle that animates the movement is this postmodernism. The ECM preachers, and I hate to call them theologians, that means study of God, and I don't know what you really can say, but the best way to refer to them, I suppose, is uh, theologians, come from mostly the liberal Roman Catholic evangelical backgrounds, and they've accepted most of the basic assumptions of postmodernism. They contend that postmodernism must be engaged as a legitimate philosophical viewpoint from within, inside, the system in order to be relevant, oh, that's an important term, the last 40-some-odd years, relevant to the, watch it, not all generations, but to the current generation. Who knows what will be relevant to the next generation, the next generation. Does that sort of sound like those of us who were alive in the 60s, uh, that, you know, it's got to be relevant? It's got to be relevant. And they define relevance and how you approach such a thing. And this feeds on another assumption that we must resort to language that addresses the, this new paradigm of our youth in keeping with, quote, the prison house of language, unquote, within their own societal group that, that it binds upon them. That's some more 1960 gibberish. Uh, it's interesting to note that they like the word paradigm, but they hate the idea of pattern. Do you know what a paradigm is? It's a pattern. Now that, is, that shows you what kind of highly educated intellectual mind you're dealing with. If we say a paradigm, we rejoice in it. If we say pattern, nah, you bunch of patternists. Well, you bunch of paradigmists. What's the difference? None. They're both, all of them are talking about some system of teaching and leading and guiding. Well, keep that in mind. The kingdom of God to these people is to be primarily concerned with all the affairs of the physical world and its environment. Now imagine, can you begin to think how these folks begin to operate in politics and social issues? And I'll give you one guess as to which party, political party, they focus on and gravitate to. I'll say no more about it than that. The spiritual concerns are of secondary importance. So you've already heard from some about the social gospel. So you see that's going to be involved in the emergent church attitude of what they would say is right and wrong. They're going to use right and wrong, but that's really what they're saying. So that's the real importance. Christianity must relate to the culture in which it lives and uh, compares the debate over the role of Christianity. Uh, they, they it must be, which is best as it fits the relevancy of what's needed today. Oh, we don't talk about what's needed yesterday. That's gone forever, and what fits then won't work now. So we've got to figure out what it's today. And before you get through dealing with what it is today, guess what? All of a sudden, you're an old man, it's tomorrow, and that group, who's 30 years behind you, are saying, you're irrelevant. 
and they better think about euthanasia when it comes to that. Uh, that seems to be something for old folks in the mind of these characters that would always be relevant if the old folks get in your way. Nothing to hold them back from removing them out of the way to find the relevance of the needs of society today. All right, Leonard, Leonard Sweet argues that Christianity must relate to the culture in which it lives and compares the debate over the role of Christianity in culture to debating the roles of hydrogen and oxygen in the air we breathe. Do you really understand what he said? Nobody else does either, and I seriously doubt he does. But the ECM approach to culture is to embrace it and utilize it for its purposes. It is a holistic surrender to the dominant culture. But see, within the dominant culture, guess what you can have? Subcultures. And that's dominant to those people in the subculture who are a part of the major culture. And who knows, but lo and behold, we learned that the major culture or the dominant culture is a part of a greater dominant culture. And that's what you've got going in these people's mind. That's the reason I say they're crazy. Brian McLaren, who's one of the most influential leaders, said this in his uh, work, The Church. As Christians who want to live in love on the other side, we had better, now the other side's whatever they conceive of heaven, we had better get a feel for postmodernity from the inside because in many ways postmodernity is the other side and it defines reality for more and more people you understand that i wish i'd copied down to the poem i hadn't heard of it in a long time and i don't know where it came from i can remember a little bit of it but this this absurdity and nonsensical stuff that's written here reminds me of of uh on a bright day two dead boys got up to fight at midnight they drew their swords and shot one another. <laughs> That's kind of what this stuff sounds like. And I don't know how you figure out really what they mean because they're telling you all the time, we'll see later, that just writing down static words really doesn't tell you all about it anyway. Except I have learned, and let's emphasize it right now, they have no problem being able to tell you exactly what they think, but if I write down what I think, or God in the Bible writes down what he thinks, you really can't know. Where language is insufficient to truly express concrete ideas. Except when they're explaining postmodernism to you. Because look at all the writing these people have done. It's, it's sort of like the atheist who says, I know God does not exist and I can prove it. And they think all the time about God and disproving God. And then they do this. The... Atheism is a religion, folks. They are as, they're overrun with God. <laughs> all the time denying it. Well, you know, if God doesn't exist, why are you so upset about it? He doesn't exist. Be satisfied and go about your business. He doesn't exist. Well, the scripture tells us God has put eternity in the heart of man. That's the reason they are haunting themselves. I think uh, Roth got up here and got a little scared the other night when the when the wind blew through at the front, he thought somebody was breaking in. Tried to wake up half the church, come down and help him. <laughs> Finally got John up at 2.30 and he came down. And we want to give Roth the new label, Ghostbuster. <laughs> so Roth is Ghostbuster, a la Ken Cone having given him that. So <laughs> Ghostbuster. Well, these guys are Ghostbusters, except it's the ghost that's doing the busting on them. Now, let me go over to this little book. Let me recommend you preachers if you don't have it. I picked this up in England some years ago. It arrived somewhere a little after the 2000. In fact, on the back it says it cost £8.99p. Ask Ken Chumley here. He'll know what that means. Uh, probably cost about £15 now, which is what, about $1.55 to a pound, so that tells you how much. Something like that, $1.60. Anyway, it's called Truth Decay, Defending Christianity Against the Challenges of Postmodernism. I'm spending time on this because everything about this emergent church is rooted and grounded in this whole postmodernistic theology and mainly their whole view on truth. Understanding the decay of truth, that's the idea, because 
It's not a matter of somebody thinking something is true and it turns out to be error. It's a matter of the very nature of truth of these people. What is the nature of truth? Now, there is what's called the correspondence view. That's just simply saying that a thing is what it is. And these brethren know what I'm about to do if I were to ask them, if I'm about to point at this microphone, because that's always my illustration. It's always here before me. That's just what it is. Now, I might use it as a hammer, but it's a microphone. By definition, it's a microphone. Doing what microphones do when it's all, all other things are equal. It's a microphone. Now, that's the correspondence view. It is just what a microphone is. It can't be anything else. You might use it for something else, but it's just what it is. Now, that's truth. I don't care what anybody says about it. That's truth. Now, listen. Truth decay is a cultural condition in which the very idea of absolute, objective, and universal truth is considered implausible, held in open contempt, and not even seriously considered. The reasons for truth decay are both philosophical and sociological, rooted in the intellectual world of ideas as well as the cultural world of everyday experience. These two worlds reinforce one another. Postmodern culture, with its increasing pluralism, relativism, information overload, heightened mobility, identity confusions, consumerism, and so forth, makes postmodernist philosophy seem more plausible. That's the way he begins, because this is what they're trying to sell you insofar as the emergent church or anybody else who's rooted in postmodernism. Just expect relativity and subjectivism through and through on all that they do. We know the truth itself does not decay. How much did Jesus say about truth? And whatever he says, it fits the correspondence view. A thing is just what it is. And ye shall know the truth. Well, it's in a spiritual context, isn't it? Ye shall know the truth. What truth? Truth that will set you free from sin. Truth that will save you. Not the truth about how to build this building, but truth relative to spiritual things. And you go from there and you see one way or the other. The Bible is clear on that. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But you have to go where the truth is. Is there an absolute objective place where God's located that truth? Yes, in his word. Thus, while we can't know all things, and there's a lot we'll be ignorant of the day we die, God expects us, he made us that way, so that we can learn enough of, of the truth to know what I must do to be saved and what I must do to be faithful to God as a child of God. And the nature of truth is, it's just things just what it is. Now, he cites in this book several scriptures on the matter. The grass withers, the flowers fall, the word of our God stands forever, Isaiah 48. He cites Matthew 24, 35, him and earth pass away, my word won't pass away. And truth has um, uh, stumbled in the streets to reference uh, some Old Testament comments, uh, such as Isaiah 59, 14. He refers to Jeremiah, and think about the work of those prophets, what they were doing at the time uh, relative to their references to truth. Jeremiah also declared to apostate Israel, truth has perished, it is vanished from their lips, Jeremiah 7. And verse 28. So we're talking about the nature of truth, which these people do not believe. I want to read you a point here that Daniel has in the book. Because it's under an emphasis that postmodernists make in the emergent church as they follow that philosophy and formulating whatever they believe in practice. Because to them, Christianity must relate to the culture, as I've already said, in which it lives and uh, com, uh, in which it moves and has its being. Brian McLaren said this, as Christians who want to live and love on the other side, what? We had better get a feel for postmodernism. Remember me reading that a moment ago? Well, what feel am I getting of? Well, in other words, what is it I'm touching? What is it I'm understanding? That truth is just whatever you think it is. Does that mean heaven is going to be that whatever, when I get there, whatever state of being I'll be, that 
everybody will just be whatever, whatever. <laughs> now, I want to ask you something. Does that make sense? I want to ask you, how is that going to help you live your life? Can you know anything right or wrong? Is there right or wrong? Now, you see why I referred you in the beginning to Judges 17, 6 in those days. There was no king in Israel, meaning there was no standard of authority and rule in Israel. But every man did that which right in his own eyes. Christianity, according to them, is to engage in the contemporary, which they would say, relative culture. Brian Bolger said this, The church universal is an emerging church, for as the body of Christ here on earth, it uh, awaits the eager anticipation of the return of its Lord. As such, it is a church always in the process of becoming. Will you tell me what that means? The church is always in the process of becoming. It has never arrived in, in any final way. What does that mean? It is a pilgrim church, living the present reality of the reign of God in its provisional form until its consummation. It emerges, in quotes, as it engages the complex mosaic of cultures represented by the peoples of the earth. In so doing, it is morphed in those cultures and exerts a redemptive influence within them. What does that mean? Now, what's interesting is that when you look at some of the stuff that some of our wild-eyed liberal people have written over the last several years, such as The Second Incarnation by Rubel Shelley and Randall Harris, they will talk about the Pilgrim Church. Now, they want you to think they are the intellectuals in the Lord's Church. Folks, they haven't said anything that some other denominational person didn't write, and they barred it. And that's exactly what we found here. We, we, as one brother said one time to the denominationalist in error, he said, I've read your books. You're not telling me anything I don't know. And that's right. These fellows don't have anything to offer. Now, let me read a little more from this other book about uh, in the chapter called The Truth About Truth. They have, or there are, two views of truth. And I want you to notice how the author dealt with this. During the House debate and Senate trial on the impeachment of Bill Clinton, opinion on whether he committed an impeachable offense generally split along party lines. Most Republicans said yes. Most Democrats, Democrats said no. This does not mean that the truth of the matter could not be known, but that the handling of the question had little to do with ascertaining objective realities. Brian Kenyon, did you hear that? Memphis School of Preaching, did you hear that? Do you know what they said? They said simply, I don't want to be confused with the facts. Let's judge this some other way. And that's what we've experienced since 2005, especially, in the church. Now watch. It had much more to do with image control, propaganda, and political posturing. The, quote, truth, unquote, of the matter could be constructed according to the needs of the politicians responsible for ascertaining the truth. You know what he's saying? Whatever worked for them to get what they wanted and to come out smelling like a rose was the truth. Forget the facts. The statement, quote, Clinton committed one or more impeachable offenses, unquote, is a statement, isn't it, Brother Rose? So it's either what? True or false? Listen to what he says. The statement, Clinton committed one or more impeachable offenses, is either true or false. It cannot be neither, or it cannot be both true and false. Law of excluded middle. No middle ground. True or false, can't be both. This presentation of the issue assumes a certain view of truth. And that gets back to the correspondence view. This microphone is a microphone is a microphone. And I have to say it is or it isn't. Okay. True statements accurately reflect or represent reality. Woo. <laughs> okay. False statements fail to do so. 
So if I say this is a banana, I have stated a what? A falsehood. Unless you're a postmodernist now. True statements accurately reflect or represent reality. False statements fail to do so. And a statement cannot be both true and false in the same respect at the same time. Now, that's the fully laid out right there, in the same respect at the same time. The correspondence view of truth is at work here, along with the notion of antithesis or either or thinking. At the same time, another view of truth was at work in the controversy, and that's the impeachment of Bill Clinton. A view enlivened by matters of political expediency. Do I hear Memphis groan? Some argued as though Clinton's objective guilt or innocence was not the issue. Now watch. What mattered, get that, what mattered was political victory and not disrupting a, now listen, and listen to what you've been hearing lately, not disrupting a, quote, good economy, unquote. It behooves certain political agendas to redescribe the situation in ways that obscured or neglected the actual facts of the matter in favor of things deemed more important. And now if you do that, you get the job at CBS, NBC, ABC, or CNN. Now watch. When viewed from this angle, the stark logic of correspondence and antithesis, that is either or, true or false, vanishes into the background or is entirely eliminated with respect to his objective guilt or innocence. And the people out in the world are going, yeah, 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 that's right, isn't he good looking? Doesn't he make a good speech? Why, well, just look how sweet he is. He must be innocent. Now, why does that have to do with the facts? But that's how people in religion operate. That's how politics function. And too often, to use something from the Bible, the people love to have it so. One's opinion concerning the Clinton case becomes a matter, uh, listen, how one constructs the discourse, how one interprets a situation given certain political and economic factors. Now you say, what does that have to do with the emergent church? How does it affect us in serving God and our approach to the Bible? If you take the latter thing we've just mentioned, and you approach God, Christ, the Bible, what must I do to be saved, what's the work of the church, what is the church, then you fall on the postmodernist side. It's whatever works, there's a lot of pragmatism here, and that becomes right. If it gets us what we want, that's the truth. Now watch what he says, common sense, have you seen much of that lately? Common sense, in quotes, seems to be waging war with itself, the writer says. On the one hand, Clinton was guilty or innocent, either or, which way did the facts go. On the other hand, it's all a matter of how you see it. So truth can be two very different kinds of things, he says, or can it? And he goes, on to, goes into it because the point is, truth is what a thing is. That's it. Whatever words I use must be words that properly describe what the thing is. It's just that way. Here's my banana. Microphone or banana. Microphone or not a microphone. Banana or not a banana. Now, objectively, that is, it doesn't make any difference whether you're male or female, rich or poor, young or old, highly educated or not educated at all, it doesn't make any difference. It's a microphone or it's not. That's objective. That's what we mean by objective. These folks don't think that way at all. So their idea is, well, we'll determine what's right and wrong. We'll determine what is truth on the basis of the postmodernistic approach to things. Now, here's what they're saying. Number one, this has to do with the, the basic tenets of postmodernism. 
The Enlightenment, that's back in the 1500s and the 1600s, also corresponding with the Protestant Reformation in Europe. They say, the postmodernist says the Enlightenment, vision of unleashing reasons, powers, in pursuit of universal knowledge and technical mastery of the world has failed. Well, what is that? It's what I said in the beginning. You observe things as they are, and you work with them by reasoning to get to a certain place. The postmodern said, we'll work anymore. So when Isaiah said, come let us reason together, he missed it. <laughs> you can't do it. When Paul said, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, well, how are you going to do that? Postmodernist says all that kind of thing's blown up. It's falling apart. Well, that's one point. Now, here's what they, you've heard this term. Here's the way they view a document, any document. And this is the reason these postmodernists, and you hear it coming out of Abilene and all over the place and the stuff they do, refer to the Bible as a meta narrative. Well, they're not just trying to say the Bible narrates something, they mean more than that, too. Uh, because I can't, you see, when I say, when I take Colossians 3.17, now others have referred to that, but he said, you know, you've got all through this without saying that. Well, I'm going to say it now. <laughs> Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. Now, when I say, you see, we must have Bible authority for all we believe in practice, the modernist sits very smug, or the postmodernist, and says, oh, this is ridiculous. How backward can you get? Because how is he looking at things? Well, remember the trial of Clinton, the two approaches? The Bible's a meta narrative. It just relates certain things to us. Listen, the meta narrative must give way to the local narratives. What? So I can't take the Bible as a whole because no one person in one culture wrote the whole thing. We've often pointed out as one of the marks of inspiration how many people are involved, where they came from, their backgrounds over the years. Well, to the, to the postmodernists, that means there's no anything there that you can really touch upon because it represents so many different cultures. Besides the one big culture all these little cultures are in, so the meta narrative must give way to the local narratives, the situational perspectives and contingencies of encultured existence. Cosmic pretense should be shunned as should be, listen, the naive hope and progress through technology or ideal forms of government. There's nothing. There's nothing that you can arrive at. There's nothing that you can say, this is a microphone. It's not to him or it's not to her. Or it's not some. You think it is. Well, fine. We're happy that you do. But don't bind on Buddy that it's a microphone when he thinks it's a sweet potato. To him, it's a sweet potato. That's his truth. And so things like this begin to develop. My God wouldn't work that way. You know what that's saying? My concept of God's true to me. You have a concept of God that's totally different. But my truth is as good as your truth. Now try to convert somebody out there. Try to come to the Bible and hear says, here's an absolute, objective, inspired, infallible revelation from God. Not from my God. And what do you mean by revelation? These folks came from all sorts of cultures and they couldn't write beyond those cultures. Well, what about inspiration? What's that? And then you get into all that kind of thing. Then notice, the societal situation of people in a cosmopolitan, media-saturated environment makes a unified worldview untenable. The notion of finding objective truth in the midst of the information-slash-internet age is a utopian illusion and should be dropped. Now, what does that tell you about their view of absolute truth as far as Christ's truth and the gospel and what Jesus said in, in uh, John 12, 48? That's why they start um, figurative, getting into figurative stuff. That's what they're forced to. So the devil, by the way, to these folks is not a person. He is just um, a metaphor for what is evil. And then you say, well, what is evil? Oh, well, who do you think it is? Now, here's a, here's a college classroom. Hand goes up. Jack raises his hand. I'm the so-called professor. We've been talking about evil. What is evil? And I smile and say, what do you think it is? <laughs> and uh, Podunk Holler over here says, I think he's sitting down eating corn for cornbread. 
And somebody else says, oh, I think he's having hors d'oeuvres. Fine. Well, I get sick on hors d'oeuvres. Well, that's evil to you. And Jack goes, what? <laughs> and now they got to where you want you. They got you where they want you. Because now anything goes. And that's all they're after. Don't tell anybody he's wrong. That's the emerging church. Now, they do it in different ways, but that's the emerging church. Now, watch this. Language is ultimately a contingent creation of human beings. It cannot represent any objectively knowable reality. He says, absolutely, objectively, and really. <laughs> now, see what I'm talking about? These people are crazy. They are intellectually crazy. You can be psychologically crazy. You can have your emotions all messed up. These folks are intellectually crazy. To sit there and be, is, can you think of a more absolute statement than that? It cannot represent any objectively knowable reality. Well, that's true or false. <laughs> it's objective. It's one or it's not. Whatever it claims to be, it is true or it's not. Now, how can they? That's the reason I say they're intellectually crazy. You mean you can't see what he's done to himself? They, they jump. You already heard about the social gospel. That's their idea of helping people. Thus, they're involved in every environmental scheme, and they hug every tree and kiss every bird and abort a baby all in the same breath and say, aren't we good? Little Jack Horner sat in the corner, and what was he doing? Eating Christmas pie, stuck in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, what a good boy am I, postmodernism. Doesn't make any sense, does it? But it helps kids learn something about words and rhymes. But what does it tell us? What's a good boy? All oh, good boys, fellas, sets the corner eating his Christmas pie, whatever it says, and a good boy sticks in his thumb. Well, a good boy sticking the pies I've got sometimes, he'll pull out a very bad burnt thumb. He won't be interested in the cherry anymore. It's silliness. Two dead boys in the middle of the day at midnight got up to fight, and they drew their swords, and they shot one another. Now, I wish you could remember the rest of it. It's just it's silly. That's, and it ends up something like saying, uh, that's what the liar told me is the truth. And that's what we've got. Except what's a liar? Tell me what a liar is. At the beginning of the 20th century, Walter Rauschenbusch and Shaler Matthews and others from liberal mainline denominations began advocating the doctrine known as social gospel. And this, I'm going to leave it at this. Which uh, is where they stressed, this is what they stressed, and think about, think about what you're hearing right now. And it's about relevant. Listen to this. Here's what they stressed. And I'll quit on that buzzer. Social justice, redistribution of wealth, establishment of a welfare state, internationalism, and the secularization of religion. Now, in later years, they added environmentalism, radical feminism, liberation theology, and so-called sexual liberation. That's the emergent church. And really, that's about a good place to stop, as I can think of. Uh, there's one more point. And I'll close on this. This is, this is a good one. This is the last point that basically undergirds these nuts. I think that instead of, this is what a fellow by the name of Michael Foucault said. I think that instead of trying to find out what truth as opposed to error is, it might be more interesting to take up the program prose by Nietzsche. How is it that in our societies, quote, the truth, unquote, has been given this value, thus placing us absolutely under its thrall? You know what he's saying? That's a microphone. That's, that's uh, truth. That's what a thing is. In this case, it's a microphone. That's what it is. Why, why have I got to call it a microphone? Why am I under those limitations? Why am I under that objective reality? I just invented that. I just invented that objective reality. That's mankind thinking. Now, what have the liberals in the church been saying about hermeneutics? The new hermeneutica is Terry Hightower calls him. That's basically what he's saying. I heard Brother Deeper one time, and I'll quit on this, say that try to get a new hermeneutica to really explain the details, the system of the new hermeneutics. And you never can get anything out of them except this. The old hermeneutics is wrong. And Brother Deaver said he reminds me of a fellow digging a hole. He never finds a place to stop. The more he does, he just goes deeper into the hole. He has no ladder to get out, but he knows that outside there's bad things. 
but he doesn't know anything but to say they're bad. Well, why do you have to replace it? Language speaks to us by the meaning of the words and how the language works. And that's through direct statements, examples, and what they imply. And there's not a postmodernist in this world that can explain, or new hermeneutics, that can explain anything about his doctrine and not do it with the language in an absolute objective way, saying it's not absolute and objective all at the same time, that everything's subjective and relative, and then turn right around and declare that this is so, folks, that direct objects, examples, and implications are wrong. And what does he use? Direct objects, and so on. That's where we are. These folks are nuts, and that's a good place to stop. Kind of get get the impression that uh, most of the lectures that we've had are dealing with nuts. Some, <laughs> I guess they just don't know it. And David's really confused me. And Jack. <laughs> Jack, Jack says, well, that's pretty easy to do, but, I mean, he had me thinking it was a microphone, and it's getting pretty close to lunch, and, and I was thinking it was a banana. Then he switched it to sweet potato, but I'm hungry. <laughs> so I guess the hungrier you are, the more that you want it to be, huh? And I thought of a couple other things, too. They, David... Uh, you probably remember this. The, the line goes, it uh, rained all night the day I left, uh, whether it was dry. Oh, Suzanne. So then don't you cry. <laughs> That's right. That's so right. And then the other one was, uh, oh, Dan, can't you see that cool water? It's what they want it to mean. They, they, they can't accept reality, so they create this never-never land out there and... Uh, and expect us to go along with that, and uh, I don't want to participate. Let, let's stick with reality. <laughs>